Hi, I'm Latangela Fay, and this is the Louisiana Film Channel's Wednesday Night at the Movies. The Louisiana Film Channel is a new entertainment service available on all devices and showcasing Louisiana films, filmmakers, and our unique lifestyles. If you're a filmmaker, you can submit your titles by clicking Content Partner on our homepage. For Louisiana lovers across the globe, you can download the app starting December 1st and experience everything Louisiana, from gators to Mardi Gras, the music, food, and culture. Now here's my co-host, Taylor Sharp, with Brian Herzog, documentary on the struggles of autism. Here is Understood. Taylor? Thanks, Latangela. We are joined now by filmmaker Brian Herzog to talk about his film, Understood. Brian, how are you today? I'm wonderful. How about yourself? Oh, great. Thanks for uh, taking time to be on our show. Listen, uh, the filmmaking business is one that's always fascinated me. Uh, when did you know that you wanted to get into this business? Well, um, I, th I think that most of the time, the best times, the best things in life generally happen to you instead of uh, figuring it out. Sometimes that happens. Uh, I was in the music industry and uh, as a producer, as well as an artist, uh, an engineer and artist. And uh, so I ended up uh, producing some records and it became very popular on the Southeast Coast. Uh, I ended up, uh, I was selling enough CDs to the point where uh, I was told that I need to get a music video and uh, I did that and I actually did it myself like I'm accustomed to doing practically everything else and um, I don't know I was one of the first people here in this region of the country to do digital recording with the uh, with a computer so I figured if it's anything similar to audio uh, editing I could probably get this thing done and that is exactly what happened. And once I was exposed to it, things just started taking off. Now, how big of a learning curve was it? You say you were in the music industry to start. What, are there any similarities between the music and movie industry? Or did you just basically have to learn it all from scratch? No, that in terms of uh, what I was speaking about was mostly uh, the software. Um, the software, uh, I figured out how to edit audio. Uh, non-linear versus the old-fashioned way. So I was one of the first people to come in and and use that particular format in terms of editing, uh, as well as shooting. Uh, so in terms of the the software itself, it was practically very similar uh, in terms of how you cut, uh, paste, uh, drag on effects, uh, move uh, clips around the timeline, etc. It was actually pretty similar now this film understood was was this your first filmmaking experience or have you had prior films as well no i i've had other experiences um the majority of my uh field of production uh in which has encompassed has encompassed uh, productions as far as uh, uh live live music uh concerts uh producing the uh, like uh, concept videos, um, uh, documentaries, TV shows, TV shows and commercial production was the bulk of the uh, my bread and butter. Uh, and in terms of the documentaries, uh, I basically traveled the world. I've been to uh, 26 countries uh, filming different various documentaries funded by the U.S. State Department in, in addition to some other funding agencies. Um, so I have had some uh, some experience with doing film, uh, working with film production itself, uh, not as much as one would normally think, but most of the time when I do something for the first time, it generally looks like something I've done uh, for quite some time. Now, the title, it, it intrigues me because, you know, understood, but then it has that question mark behind it. That makes me feel like someone's almost misunderstood without giving too much away. Uh, what can viewers expect while watching this film? What, what is kind of the, the premise behind this film? What, what I really wanted to encompass out of this production was the vision that I had particularly was to place the viewer inside the brain, the mind of a person with autism. Uh, because of the fact that it's something that's uh, it's very it's very much not understood 
And so the the premises for the production is to somewhat place the viewer in the mind of a person with autism so that they can uh, better understand the challenges and particularly understand how to deal with people a little bit easier with that particular um, affliction. Well, Brian, um, I, I can't wait to watch the film. Let's bring it to you right now. This is understood. parties. I don't like new directions. Three stop signs, past a red light with the post office on the left. Ryan said it to me three times, but sometimes I get it mixed up. Well, I'm here now. So glad you made it. I see the directions worked out. Oh, this place is so beautiful, and I came early to help. Oh, thanks. Well, you don't need to help. Um, can I take your stuff? Okay. Make yourself comfortable. Go get a drink or something. Okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you much. But I can help. I could do a lot to host a party. And this party's Susie. about a volunteer work with the disabled Susie. veterans. Susie, we're so glad you're here. Oh, hey, how are you? Fine. I'm here to volunteer. I could help. Oh, nonsense. Just relax. But I want to. Excuse me, Miss Susie. What else would you like to be done? Um, we still need to set out the coffee cups. We need a place for the guest umbrellas. We'll put ice in the big bowl. I'm going to set out the hands. Wait, hand slow down. Cups. I think I'm just going to go work on the flower arrangements with the floss. And you just make sure the guest of honor's relaxed. I can't remember who that is. Coffee cups, ice in a bowl, umbrella holder, hand sanitizer, floss for flowers. All right. Hey, Miss Susie, what can I get for you? Yes, um, I want an extra whip uh, without the cream, please. What do you mean without the cream, Miss Susie? You know... A half a shot. I don't know what you mean. I want a half a shot of vanilla and extra whipped cream. Can I get a water? Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Miss Susie. Would you like something to drink? Susie? I know what I want. I just can't get it out because of my autism. Susie? No, thank you. I really wanted coffee. Hey. Hey. Hey, your flowers are so beautiful. Well, of course, they're lovely. Let us put one on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. may I have another one? Oh, sure. No, 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 no. This is for someone else. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. How are you doing, Miss Susie? Hey, Miss Susie. Of course. 
It's Sergeant Ben, our disabled veteran. Are you ready? Can I have your attention, please? Everyone, come on, come close, come close. Come on. Come on. Thank you, thank you. I want to thank every one of you for coming tonight so that we can honor one of our beloved friends. No better reason to have a party than to honor him. And Sergeant Ben would like to do the honors. When I had my trait and couldn't communicate because of your Asperger's, you were the only one that understood what I was going through. And tonight, Miss Susie, we're honoring you. Welcome back. We are joined again by Brian Herzog. Brian, just watched the film and I loved it. It, it had my attention from the start because you mentioned the, the autism theme around it, but as I'm watching the movie, I, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on. It almost, it almost seemed like Alzheimer's at first when I was watching because you know, she, she couldn't remember the directions to get to the event, and then she couldn't remember what she was ordering. Like, she wanted coffee, and she didn't know how to say it. And then when that inner voice played, and she says, well, it's because I suffer from autism, you know, that one hit me, and I was like, it, it really helped me understand the struggle that people with autism go through. Um, I think the inner voice, just her talking inside of her head, I think that made the entire film. I think that was the most powerful part of the film. Um, what were you trying to do with that inner voice? Were you trying to let people know that people with autism, they know what they want to do. They just don't always know how to express it. Was that the goal of that? 
Well, I, that was my vision when I decided, when I said I want to somehow place the viewer in the mind of a person with autism. And everybody wondered, well, how do we do that? And that's exactly what I, what I thought was an inner voice. And this inner voice could, it's clear. Everybody knows this is the inner voice and this is a good way to articulate it. First of all, I want to say that um, uh, Kay Landon, she was the writer for this particular uh, film. And Susie Labrie was the, she played herself uh, as a, a woman with autism, Asperger's. And she had a great deal to do with the input of, of things that she can easily forget and vice versa in different various uh, uh, aspects of the, the film so that we could be as accurate as possible. Um, so the yes, the inner voice was to me the the most articulate way to get people to understand, okay, this is the, the thought process. Yes. Yeah, um, you mentioned the Asperger's as well. I thought that was a great plot of the story when she shows up and she thinks she's volunteering for disabled veterans and then one of the veterans stands up at the end and actually says that you know she's the guest of honor because earlier in the film they talked about you sit down and you make sure the guest of honor is relaxed and she's right. like well i know who the guest of honor is i just can't remember at the end of the film it turns out she is in fact that guest of honor i love the way you did that um how did you come in contact with miss Susie, and how did you wind up meeting her Oh my God, uh, I think it was sometime before Katrina. Um, and I used to, I was very uh, actively involved in the film meetup uh, organization here in Baton Rouge. And, uh, you know, I was involved with helping to try to create projects for people, uh, for local uh, actors here. And uh, Susie, uh, she, was, she was one of the, she was the uh, organizer for the uh, Baton Rouge uh, Louisiana, the, the Baton Rouge film meetup group here in Baton Rouge. And uh, so she was, I mean, Susie, even during that time when we shot that, Susie with with Asperger's and dealing with those things, Susie had been in over 300 films during the time that we shot that. And then we also shot it on, we sh the day that it was shot on was World Autism Day the actual holiday for, for World Autism. And that's the day that we actually shot it. Um, it was also a 48 hour uh, film project. So uh, we, we shot that, the whole pro project was done within 48 hours. Now, that sounds like a busy two days. I know I couldn't get it done in 48 hours. Um, take me through the process a little bit of that 48 hours. Um, how did you start your day? Did you sleep at all? I mean, give us a little bit of how hectic those two days might have been. Well, you know, it's, you know, it's when you're, when you're really focused, it doesn't seem as hectic. And we had a great crew of people. They were all local people uh, here uh, that were helping. And it was all a voluntary uh, thing. So every, everyone, including, you know, everyone, myself and everyone included, we did this to try to create something to be a service for people. Um, that particular day, um, I, I just, I just used my space here at Celtic Studios. I allowed uh, Kay Landon and the other people that co were the co-writers, and I would every now and then maybe try to put something in there. But they basically put the entire script together, and uh, based on, um, and, and of course, with Susie being a part of that too, with some of her input uh, prior to that. Um, and then once the script was put together, it was like we didn't, the way that that thing works is you don't really, you can't like start early because they give you criteria and limitations so that you can't start until the exact moment. And so it basically started from uh, putting the, the film together while that was transpiring as, it, as the film was being written on the spot. I was basically... Um, uh, I was simultaneously placing film crew members on location, just kind of, you know, getting the equipment together and just being on standby. Once it was actually done, uh, the writers, of course, we got writers, the portions of the, uh, the, the co-writers also were a part of the film. So everybody leaves Celtic Studios, goes on remote, and basically we just start hammering it out right then and there. And... Um, uh, we did it. 
I think we basically it was it it was a it, it, you couldn't waste any time for sure, uh, but it was definitely something that it was challenging, and I love to be challenged. And uh, but it, we had a great crew. Everybody had an amazing, uh, giving, and very workable, friendly attitude. And in any type of filmmaking or any type of professional production, it's always an amazing additive when every single body, every person there is on the same page, energy-wise. And everybody just had this incredible energy. Uh, I think that once everybody understood the script, everyone knew that this was going to be something good, not just a short film, but something that could really do some good out there. I've heard a few people uh, tell me, more than a few actually, tell me that they they cried, you know, after watching it. And to me, I felt like, you know, in that short a time to grab someone's heartstrings, I think it, it means that it's real. We're dealing with real energy uh, that's to be of service to the world. And I think uh, mission completed. Yeah, Brian. Job well done for everybody. I definitely enjoyed the film. Um, I thought it was well done. I loved how you let Miss Susie play herself. Um, look, that's all the time we have today. I can't wait to check out what you do in the future. And thanks for joining us today. I hope you're enjoying our Wednesday night at the movies. I'm Latangela Fay, and each week here on the Louisiana Film Channel, we have a special called Hollywood on the Bayou, produced by our friend and mentor, Ed Poole. I can't wait to see what exciting part of Louisiana film history he has for us this week. Take it away, Ed. Thanks, LaDangela. For this episode, we want to take a trip back to the beginning of the film industry in Baton Rouge, back to 1917. Unlike today, in 1917, Baton Rouge was still a very small town. The 1910 census has the Baton Rouge population at 14,800. That's less than half the size of an average enrollment for the local LSU campus. To compare, the 1910 census for New Orleans was 350,000. Another thing to consider, all the early silent films up into the teens were called shorts, as they were usually one or two reels, with each reel about 10 to 12 minutes. A feature film was considered at least five reels or over an hour in length. While New Orleans had produced about 50 films by this time, only a couple of them were feature films. But Baton Rouge's first film was to be a feature film. Keep this in mind as we flash back to 1917 with the feature film, Burning the Candle. Although several national film companies had come to New Orleans to shoot their photo plays, the first major movie studio to film on location in Baton Rouge was the SNA Film Manufacturing Company. SNA was founded in 1907 by George Spohr and Gilbert Anderson, creating the name S&A. It was based in Chicago, Illinois and Niles Canyon, California, and their stars included box office favorites such as Francis X. Bushman, Gloria Swanson, and of course studio co-owner, actor and director, Gilbert Bronco Billy Anderson, who was billed as the first Western movie star. SNA had become a major studio mainly because of the 150 Bronco Billy Western shorts, which were extremely popular at the time, and their series of Charlie Chaplin comedies. In 1917, SNA sent a cast and crew to Baton Rouge to secure exterior scenes for their drama Burning the Candle. According to trade reports, this was the first recorded time that the Baton Rouge area was chosen for any type of film work. The acting roster for this film included Henry G. Walthall, Mary Charlson, Patrick Calhoun, Thurlow Brewer, Frankie Raymond, and Julian Barton. Harry Beaumont directed the film. Walthall was at that time considered the greatest character actor on the screen. With the career spanning almost 30 years and 325 film credits, Walthall is remembered and seen here in D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation. 
Burning the Candle was his 215th film. Starring alongside Walthall was Irish actress Mary Charlson. Walthall and Charlson had starred in eight films together between 1916 and 1919. They married in 1918 and remained together until his death in 1936. Burning the Candle presented no moral message, and the only villain in the film was alcohol, even though it was three years before the era of Prohibition. In the film, Walthall portrays James Maxwell, a young man who has a weakness for alcohol. After marrying his southern sweetheart, Molly Carrington, played by Charlson, he takes her to live in New York where he becomes a cotton broker. In New York, he frequently has occasion to drink and within a year has become an alcoholic. He ultimately loses his job, his wife, and his self-respect. His wife returns home to her family in the South and soon demands a divorce. Not willing to lose his love, the young man struggles to defeat his addiction, regain his job, and win back the love of his wife. Exterior scenes for burning the candle included the cottage, a plantation built in 1824 and located on the Mississippi River Road south of Baton Rouge. It served as the southern home of Molly. This was considered one of the first times a Louisiana plantation was included to give authenticity to a film. Other scenes were shot in and around Baton Rouge. Referring to Baton Rouge, director Beaumont reported that the little city furnishes excellent material for typical southern exteriors. According to reports, the town of Baton Rouge, its mayor, police chief, and leading citizens turned out en masse to welcome Walthall and the rest of the cast and crew. In addition, Charlson was presented a coal black baby lamb by a group of her fans. Burning the Candle was released in the U.S. on March the 5th, 1917, and was proclaimed to be one of the best feature productions ever put out by SNA. Unfortunately, as with many films during the silent era, Burning the Candle is considered a lost film. Another lost treasure is The Cottage, which can also be seen in two other films, Cinerama Holiday in 1955 and Band of Angels in 1957. Tragically, the plantation was hit by lightning and destroyed by fire in 1960. All that remains are some pillars. Through the years, locals and visitors have reported seeing apparitions and hearing noises. Some believe it's the spirit of Angus Holt, who was the tutor hired by the plantation owners and who had lived there most of his adult life. Others believe they are the souls of the 70 passengers and crew of the steamboat Riverboat Princess, headed to Mardi Gras, who perished in an explosion on February the 27th, 1859, near the cottage. Whatever the reason, the cottage ruins remain a popular attraction for locals and on many haunted tours. This has been a presentation of Hollywood on the Bayou, preserving Louisiana's rich film history with books, prints, presentations, and exhibits. If you have questions, comments, or to learn more, you can visit our Facebook page or sign up for our Louisiana and Film newsletter, which is on our website, HollywoodOnTheBayou.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Louisiana Film History Flashback. Sue and I thank you, and we'll see you next time. Good evening, film fans. I'm Latangela Fay, and this is the Louisiana Film Channel's Wednesday Night at the Movies. The Louisiana Film Channel is a new entertainment service, officially launching December 1st. Louisiana Film Channel will be available on all devices and showcasing Louisiana films, filmmakers, and our unique lifestyles. If you're a filmmaker, you can submit your titles by clicking Content Partner on our homepage. For Louisiana lovers across the globe, you can download the app starting December 
first and experience everything Louisiana, from gators to Mardi Gras, the music, food, and culture. Now here's my co-host, Taylor Sharp, with a heartwarming documentary entitled Keeping the Promise from Sandy Parker. Thanks, Latangela. Joined right now by Sandy Parker, the director of Keeping the Promise. Sandy, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for joining us. Um, tell me a little bit about you as a filmmaker. Was Keeping the Promise your first film or did you have previous films? Keeping the Promise was my first film, but I had already been working in the film industry uh, since 1996 when I got my first craft service job. Since then, I've mostly worked as a script supervisor and uh, got a lot of experience doing that, but this was my first time writing and directing my own project. Okay, so you had experience in the film industry. This was just your first time calling the shots, right? Yeah. Okay, and what, what got you into the filmmaking business? You know, um, I always wanted to be in film. I just didn't know how to get there. I ended up studying photography at an advertising school in Atlanta. And um, after that, I worked as a photo assistant on still shoots and was doing some stylist work. And then I randomly met someone who was starting a production company to make commercials in Portland, Oregon. He was a friend of a roommate of mine, and I was just like, oh, you know, you should hire me sometime, because lots of times I, I uh, am not working, and I'm used to 12-hour days. And so the next day he called me and hired me to work craft service on a commercial, and that was my introduction. But I very quickly became interested in learning to do script supervision, and so I kind of trained myself and took every advantage um, I could. You know, whenever I got the opportunity to shadow another script supervisor, I did it, or even just to pepper them with questions to find out as much as I could. Because it's, uh, it's a very lonely position. We're a department of one. So getting to talk to another script supervisor is a big deal. Yeah, uh, it sounds like you slowly are working your way up the ladder. Um, this film, Keeping the Promise, without giving too much away, what can viewers expect in this film? What type of film, subject matter? Give us a little bit without giving away too much. What, what do viewers expect or what should they expect? What, what, what can they expect when watching this film? Gotcha. Um, well, this film was made because um, a local nonprofit uh, by the name of Eden House approached my uh, women in film chapter here in New Orleans and asked if we would create a film to help them market themselves to people basically touring their facility and um, maybe thinking of donating or helping in some way. So um, most people who see this film probably will already, at least until now, most people seeing this film were already familiar with Eden House and may have known that what they do is that they provide wraparound services to women who've been trafficked or have worked as prostitutes. And it's a two-year program where the women actually live there on site in a beautiful house with seven other women. So it's eight women at a time. And uh, they live there for two years and they're, they're uh, provided education. They're taught how to... Um, balance their checkbook. They get dental work done that they may have not been able to have since they were children. And um, most women and men too, if anyone who's gone, who's been taken into a life of prostitution and human tra trafficking, they're basically stuck at wherever they were when that happened. So if they've only been eating fast food their whole lives, it's been brought to them by their Johns or whatever. Uh, or their pimp, they um, they may not know how to wash dishes properly. You know, there's a lot of things that they just they skipped over in life. So um, this film talks about what this program provides and tells the story of two women in their own words about how they uh, found themselves in this situation and made the decision to get themselves out of it with the help of programs like Eden House. Well, Sandy, it definitely sounds like a very heavy, hard-hitting topic. I can't wait to check out the film now. Let's bring it to you right now. This is Keeping the Promise. I don't 
The average age of entry into prostitution for an American girl is 12 to 14. Babies. Children. If somebody gets you and introduce you to something 10 years old, 12 years old, and all that, by the time you age out, what do you have left? You don't even have a guidance. You don't know where to go. I'm talking about your, my little girl. There's a little girl in here, you know, so I have to go back and get her. It's a bigger problem than anyone wants to look at. Worldwide, among the illegal uh, trade, humans have surpassed guns and are now number two behind drugs as the biggest commodity sold. Not only is the United States one of the largest demand countries in the world for human trafficking services, we have a large problem with domestic minor sex trafficking. So children, youth, being sucked into the sex trade. This is something that's been going on for decades. And people all over the world has had this in their community all along, but they chose to overlook it. You know, right today, I really don't understand how I ended up in human trafficking and prostitution. I can remember I was standing in a group picture at my school at 10. And then at 12 years old, all of a sudden, I'm in sex trafficking. I don't even know how that happened. How did I jump from there to that lifestyle? Coming out of prostitution myself, I knew that there were women still on the streets that believed the lie that there was no way out. Coming out and being given an opportunity uh, to reclaim my own life, I wanted to go and share, you know, that I found the way out and this is the way and we are worthy, uh, God does have a plan for us. People we don't understand what be told in our heads. The reason we don't be able to tell you guys or, or find a way to try to get out of it. And the more you try to get out of it, the more you get stuck in it. So if I don't know how to get out of it between 12 and 18 years old, nobody's in the community is coming to get me out of it. The system show not even looking for me to get me out of it. What in the world are we to do and where are we to go? I met Regina two years ago. She talked about Clemmie, but I didn't get to meet Clemmie until a couple months later when Clemmie came down to help us actually open the house. And hearing their story about being in a crack house together, about thinking they would die there, and not ever seeing a way out, and talking and dreaming about if anybody ever gets out. Dreaming in a way that you dream when you think it's never possible. But it was. And I would beg her, I'm like, if you make it out of here, you better come back and get me because this is not what God has for us. And, um, and if I make it out, I'm going to come back. And Regina got out and went back to find Clemmie and got her into the Magdalene house and helped her recover. And so Regina, by keeping her promise to Clemmie, kept her promise to other women and girls because now Clemmie is helping so many others. The first thing to take place when someone new uh, comes in to begin the pro program is a bunch of love. Bunch of love, bunch of hugs, bunch of understanding, bunch of patience. Before they get to the porch, they're handed a key and we have them open the front door to the house and walk in. We don't use our keys because we say this is your home and you have a key to your home. This is your new home. You are here and we will get you all of the resources that you need to have a foundation to stand up on, to empower them, to take their lives back. And it's an amazing and intense and joyful and exciting moment. Whatever point they entered the street, 10, 11, 12, that's where their lives are really taken from them, snatched away. So we say, when you were a little girl and dreaming, what were you dreaming of? Go back there and let us help you build from that point forward a new life for yourself. And every woman has her own two-year plan because every woman is unique. So when the women come into Eden House, uh, most likely they've either been on the streets since they were teenagers, or even if they haven't, they've been in home situations in which there were not a lot of good role models in terms of limits, parenting, and basic life skills. So we realize that we have to really start with the basics in everything that we do. 
you know, when you get ready, when you decide, I don't want to turn one more trick, I, I don't want to take one more piece of dope, um, I'm done with this, there is something else on the other side. And the, the something else is you, you know, choosing you. So I just wanted to go back and let them know, hey, I found a way out and you can come out too. And that's what my job is, to go back in and let them know that we don't got to believe the lie anymore. We don't have to die out here. It's really a community failure that we allow human beings to be sold on our streets. And then we must all come together as a community to be able to solve the problem together. Only thing I'm asking people to really, really uh, know and understand about sex trafficking is that you need to get involved. I tell people all the time, the reason we just call the hood the hood is because the neighbor has been taken out. So I can't say neighborhood no more because the neighborhood do not look out for each other like they used to. I'm about a purpose, I'm about a solution, and I'm asking you to understand that we, together, we can do something about it. That's what I want people to understand. If it seems like there's no way out, and it seems dark, and it seems like you may die in that lifestyle, that there is hope. It can be done. It's not easy, but there's hope and there's love and there's the support that you need out there to change your life and really turn it in a new direction. Welcome back. We are joined once again by Sandy Parker. Sandy just got done with the film. It was heavy stuff. I mean, right out of the gate, you hear the facts about sex trafficking and how some of these girls are as young as 10 years old once they get into the sex trafficking business. That was shocking to me. I really enjoyed it. Um, my overall takeaway would be the... the the shooting of the shots you use, the background noise, what what emotions were you trying to convey there? Because it was heavy stuff. I felt that um, it was really important because it's so heavy and because it's, it's such a human instinct to just want to shut it all out. I wanted to drive home the fact that this stuff happens in real life in our neighborhoods and we all have to be, be vigilant. I have to protect children who are not my children, but it's still my responsibility to be aware of anything strange going on in my neighborhood or uh, if I do interact with children, uh, which we all do in one area or another in our lives, if they're acting out in some way, you know, you've got to be aware and consider the possibilities of what might be happening. I, I even think back to my own childhood, like in junior high, things that other children told me that I didn't understand that I now think back on and I can't remember all the details, but I wonder if there was something happening in their households and they were trying to ask for help and I didn't understand, you know? Well, Sandy, it's interesting you mention how, you know, sex trafficking doesn't get talked about a lot. That was my first thought watching this film. I thought to myself, wow, these numbers are staggering. How come sex trafficking doesn't get talked about more? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Is it because lack of films like yours? Why does sex trafficking kind of get put in the back of everybody's mind and never talked about? I think maybe in some parts of the world it is thought about and talked about, but we don't happen to live in those places. We live somewhere. Of course, we live in a country that was founded originally by Puritans seeking religious freedom to be as 
conservative as they wanted to be. You know, that's what the pilgrims were all about. Uh, and I and I know that that has permeated our culture. And I also think those of us who were raised in loving, normal, functional families, we're not prone to think about this because it's so alien to our way of thinking and anything I've been exposed to or had been exposed to. But when we were sitting interviewing these women, I mean, the whole crew, there were like a dozen of us, and it was just so profound. We were all just, you know, when Clemmie's talking about herself as a child and we're listening to this, there were things she said that are not included in the film that were so dark. I just have goosebumps all over my arms just talking about it. And, um, you know, I guess it's our innocence is part of it. It's not so much that we we want to avoid it, but we just don't even know. Yeah, I actually thought that was the best part of the film when she was explaining that the reason that she works with these young girls is because she was one of them. You know, she shows the yearbook yeah. picture and she says that yeah. two short years later, she was involved in sex trafficking. And yeah. those numbers blew my mind. Look, I absolutely love the film. I thought it was very well done and hard hitting. Thanks. Very informative. Um, what is next for you as a filmmaker? Well, I have written and directed two short films since then that were both narratives, so not documentaries like uh, Keeping the Promise. And I, I just had such a great time on those projects. I, it feels so good to create something that didn't exist before, you know? And then the collaborative process is, I find really fulfilling, and um, and it's really great to be able to to call the shots for a change and have people there to help me. It's it's humbling, really. And so um, my dream, my my holy grail, all along has been to write and direct a feature film. So I. I'm working on my second feature length script. Um, I set the first one aside. I'm working on this one. I'm really hoping that this is one that I can make here in New Orleans. It's entitled Swamp Scouts. It's about some kids in 1950s New Orleans. Uh, they hang out at this little clubhouse they built in the swamp, but then one of them unfortunately becomes the witness to a uh, murder of his priest and his grandpa has to take him out to the swamp to wait for things to blow over. But a lot of hilariosity ensues and it's really, it's a movie with a lot of heart and I'm hoping that it can be done on a fairly modest budget. And I think that there's a lot of interest right now for something lighthearted and um, nostalgic about a time when kids used to have their own secret lives running around the neighborhood and riding their bikes and having adventures that their parents maybe didn't even know about, but it was all good, clean fun. So that's, that is what I'm working towards right now. Well, Sandy, you did a great job on this film. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was very informative, hard hitting. I'm sure you're well on your way to getting that full length feature film. I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Taylor. I really enjoyed this, and it was an honor to be included. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed having you. I hope you're joining our conversation live on Twitter right now. We want you to comment on all of this. Now, each week here on the Louisiana Film Channel, we have a special called On Location, produced by Jamie Freeman. I can't wait to see where she takes us this week. Here is On Location. You can't make movies without actors, and you can't find actors without casting directors. And Liz Kulan is one of the best in Louisiana. She's been in operation since 2003, casting film, television, and commercials, and placing Louisiana actors in major productions. Let's go chat with her. My name is Liz Kulan. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and my company is Kulan Casting. We cast principal actors in film, television, and commercial productions. Um, I'm from Louisiana. I started casting in Louisiana in 2003, about the same time that the state started offering tax credits to productions. Um, I started my first company, casting background actors. And then in 2005, um, I formed Coulon Casting. And that's when I started 
casting principal actors or speaking roles. Um, and that was right after Hurricane Katrina. So um, production, we were casting in Shreveport and New Orleans and everywhere in between. Um, about five years later, in 2010, we started my casting file. So all in all, I've been working in the Louisiana film industry for 17 years. My casting file is basically a bridge between talent and casting companies. Um, so uh, new talent, whether you're a background extra or an aspiring actor, you can create a profile at mycastingfile.com and log in every day to look at your dashboard, submit yourself to the jobs or the open calls that you're interested in working. And on the other hand, my casting file is basically um, like booking software or um, a booking platform for extras casting companies and an extensive searchable database. Um, so my business is 100% dependent on the film industry, there being a film industry. So when the industry dries up here, so does work for me, my assistants, and the actors. So typically when a production hires me to cast, I do local casting. So they might have their top stars attached and I'll cast the other 30 or 40 speaking roles. So that's 30 or 40 jobs for local actors, sometimes regional act actors, but we always try to hire local. And then, um, and that's just principal actors, that's the speaking roles. There's hundreds of extras in productions also. Um, the big thing is take it seriously. You know, take it seriously and practice. You shouldn't expect to just show up on, you know, get a job and show up on set and be able to act. Um, so get into classes. And right now it's, it's really an interesting time because um, everything's going virtual because of COVID. So you have the opportunity to take a virtual class that you might not have been able to get into before. Um, so use this downtime to really practice and work on acting. Um, I would also say you need to join all the, all the acting platforms. Um, you need to join Actors Access. Um, you need to join casting networks. If you're brand new and you don't have um, a lot of experience, you might also want to join my casting file. Liz clearly knows her stuff. Check out her website, kuloncasting.com, for more information and resources for aspiring actors. I might go check them out myself. I'm ready for my close-up. We've had such a wonderful time traveling around the state of Louisiana and meeting all of the wonderful people involved in the film industry. What we've learned is that there's a lot of production coming. We expect four television shows and three feature films that are currently prepping to be in production sometime in late September or early October. To know what's going on in Louisiana, stay tuned for On Location in Louisiana. Well, that's a wrap on this week's show. Watch for our app coming December 1st to all platforms, including Apple TV, Android, Chromecast, and more. I'm LaTangela Fay for Louisiana Film Channel. Thank you for joining me for this week's field trip. See you on the red carpet.